preach, but let's see. Um, today's going to be quite heavy on teaching, by the way, just to sort of, if it hasn't been long enough already, it's going to be quite a heavy teaching one, because um, that's what I feel I've, I've been kind of given to bring, but it's changed literally this morning. So let's see what God does with it. We were having a discussion at home about education recently. My daughter, I think, raised the question of which one, which one, history or geography at school? Yeah, which one, history or geography? And I was like, are you asking which one I hated the most or which one I liked the most? Because I didn't like either of them. I wasn't into either history or geography. Um, in fact, I dreaded both. When you, We used to write out our school. Did you do this if you're old? Write out your school schedules? You guys don't know, do you? You just have to write them out on a piece of paper and you have them in your pocket or in the back of your diary and you look at it and, that, and I saw history. I'm like, oh, no. And my history teacher was monotone. He's like, welcome everyone to history today. We're going, oh. And geography went all over my head. Um, if I could go back to my 12-year-old self, first I'd give myself a load of sports results, Back to the Future 2, amazing. I do a load of that, you know, go out. And then the other thing I do is say, Andy, listen to geography and history. It's so important to know how the world is shaped through history and how geography is shaped through things that are going on. We, we, we see it right now. Look at, look at Afghanistan. Look at Ukraine. Look what's going on. History and geography working is how the world gets shaped uh, and things move around. It impacts dramatically on where things are. There's so many lessons we don't learn by not looking at what's happened in history and geography across the world. And um, as a Christian... As a Christian, we should understand how the power shifted around the world. We're looking at Persia at this time when we're looking in the book of Ezra at the moment and how God uses that shifting around to kind of work out his purposes. And we need to learn and be taught by these things as well. And so we're in this book called Ezra. If you don't know what that is, it's a book in the Old Testament and you can look it up on your device or in your Bible. But I think it's worth having a little pause before we actually carry on and just do a little bit of history and geography. Then I'm going to try something different, and that's why I'm worried about time today. But let's just see, because I want to walk through the scripture. And then at the end of it, I've got a completely different set of conclusions, handwritten this morning, about what I think God wants to say. But let's at least give it a try. So hopefully if I've got control. The one thing I want to kind of kick off with is, as we work through the scripture today, I want to, because I'm going to go through it in, quite a, in full, I want to remind us, because I think it's going to start to pinch a bit. There's some things in what I want to say today that are going to be quite difficult to, to read or understand. And a reminder, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All of those sound pretty tough, but it's because of our lack of acceptance of the word of God as authority over our lives that we get ourselves in a lot of trouble and a big mess it's because we don't absorb the word. We don't live under the authority of the word. We don't let it do this, that we end up in so many difficult situations. We think, what's going on with my life? Because we're not, we're counteracting, we're challenging, we're saying, I see what the word of God says, but you know what? Here's my version of things. And that's one of the biggest challenges we see in the story of Ezra, is people doing things their own way. But God's heart is to continually bring us back. Scripture is like medicine. As my mum used to say, I know it tastes nasty, Andy, but it's really good for you. There's some things where you take some medicines like, Wah! but usually the one that tastes the worst is the one that does the best. So here's some geography. Let's set ourselves up for this. Um, so um, this is Persia. This is modern names, but that brown is Persia. The reason I want to mention that is because look at the size of it. So when we talk about soon about the king of Persia, it's the king of that. So, so it's all the way over into Greece, right the way across into India. And what I've marked in the middle there is Jerusalem and where the tribes of this story were scattered. So you get them scattered up into what's now Iraq and Syria and down into Babylon. And they're scattered across this nation. But look at the size of it. So when you hear references for the king of Persia, just realize what's happened. He is a king of Persia. All of this. This is it kind of as it was, more the older names. And just, there's Jerusalem, which is where our story is coming. They're coming back to Jerusalem because the Israel, the Jewish nation, was scattered, but they were predominantly, or a large number of them, sorry, were in Babylon. And this story is them coming back from Babylon, back to Jerusalem. The 12 tribes being spread um, and then coming back in to Jerusalem. Um, now, here's the timeline that we need to 
be aware of. And I know you probably can't see that in great detail, but the timeline we're working on, because um, we need this, because we need to understand as we get to Ezra 7, what's this timeline in history? So we're in BC, um, and that timeline you're seeing there is from 539 BC to 423 BC. So this is from the reign of King Cyrus on the left, and it goes all the way now. We're going to pick up soon with this new reign of this King Artaxerxes the first. Um, and if I zoom in a little bit more, let's just get ourselves around the sort of storyline we're in here. So 537 BC, so this, this left-hand side. Cyrus tells the Israelites, you can come back. So they've been, they've been taken into captivity, they've been exiled out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's been destroyed, and Cyrus says, you can, you can come back to Jerusalem, and he financially facilitates everything they need to do. He provides for them to come back in, and they're going to rebuild the temple. This is led by a man called Zerubbabel, um, which is a great name. Um, but in reality, if you've been with us, Ezra 1 to 6 should really be called Zerubbabel, not Ezra, because we haven't met him yet. Um, the temple that they then build takes 21 years to finish. So once they're back, they're rebuilding this temple, this place of worship for them, and it takes 21 years to build. So there's lots of challenges along the way. And as you heard a little bit last week, this was under the reign of Darius I. Once they finish building it, it's a bit of an anticlimax. And it doesn't really fulfill everything they expected, but it's still a critical place of worship. But here's where you may, so the story feels like it moves quite quickly and then there's 21 years, but then there's this huge gap that you may not be aware of between Ezra 6 and 7, which I think I marked, which is here, which is a huge delay in time that goes on because actually it takes 58 more years for anything to happen. So the, the, the temple is built, and then there's really nothing much happening in this story for 58 years, unless you want to read the book of Esther, which is there. Which the book of Esther and the story of Esther sits in the middle of that time. And this is another time when the uh, Jews are about to be killed, slaughtered, and because of a, a, a queen called Esther, they are spared. So these guys go through these really challenging times, even within that timeline. And just so you get a little bit more context, right then, here, you'll see as we're coming into this part of the story now, there's been this gap of 58 years, and there's a revolt going on in Egypt. Things are really messed up. So the whole region is in quite a lot of difficulty. And that's kind of a little bit important when we come to it. But the thing is, you're about to meet for the first time in the book of Ezra, Ezra. You hadn't met him yet. He hadn't, you might have thought so, but he's not been in the story yet because of that gap. So that gap, you've got Zerubbabel, then this huge gap of time of 50 plus years, and now Ezra appears. And um, he's one of three returns. So the first return of the, uh, the Jewish people to Jerusalem is about rebuilding the temple. This return is about rebuilding the Torah and the religious systems. And then the last one will be about rebuilding of the walls under Nehemiah. So let's just turn to Ezra 7, if you've got it in your Bibles, um, and let's meet the man behind the story. And I'm going to walk through it, a sort of fairly fast click, but there's a big message I think I want to bring out of this, and I'm going to see what God does with it. Because the Word is central to this church. They built the building, but what Ezra's about to really emphasize is the authority of the Word within it. He's going to put it right in the heart and the center of it again. The church without the word is a social club. The church with the word in the spirit is a study location. But the church with the word and the spirit within it is a place where God can move powerfully and does move powerfully. So let's, let's read. Let me just see if this all works. It says, now after this, now that little comment is, after this means 58 years. So after 58 years, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah. So the first time, this is Ezra gets a mention. Then there's a list. Okay, another list, which I'm not going to read. But the, No, I'm not going to read it. The important thing, though, is you get to this bit here. I'm going to use, oh, look, I can point. It's like the good old days. Um, finally, you get the, the genealogy back to the son of Aaron, who's the great high priest. Moses, his brother the first high priest in the tabernacle. So he's part of this line that goes all the way back to Aaron, the chief priest. That gives him some 
credentials. Then it says, this Ezra went up from Babylon. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all he, that he asked, for the hand of the Lord God was upon him. Basic definition of scribe, copyist. Copying, transcribing. Okay? But Ezra's different. Ezra's from a line. And also, the point is, they say he's skilled. The skilled thing actually translates, translates more like skilled and rapid. Like he knew what the Torah said. He knew what the Old Testament, he knew his Bible to the extent where he could react to things. So if someone said this, he would say, yep, it means that. Someone said this, he said, no, that's not okay because of this. This is what the Bible says. He was that fast with it. That was the skill they meant. So it was almost like the front of his mind and the tip of his tongue. And Ezra is attributed, some say, with the reason we, the Jews and the Christians, are called the people of the book. Now, you may not know what that really means, but that is of huge significance in Islam. We are referred to as the people of the book. And Muhammad was told when he was given the Quran to go and verify it with the people of the book. The Jews and the Christians were to verify the prophecy given to Muhammad. Did you even know that? They're supposed to come to the Christians and the Jews to say, is this correct? So to be called the people of the book, to have an entire faith system checked against what we believe, means that book is of incredible importance. That book is central to the determination of even Islam. Muhammad is told, go check with the people of the book. That's us. We're the people of the book. Are we though? <laughs> you know, that's what we're called. But the challenge I've got today is, well, are we? Because that's what we're, we're called. So, Ezra is what we would lovingly call today as well, lovingly, a nerd. He knows in that intimate detail that Dave Abrahams knows about Marvel, that Emily and Matt Nail know about Star Wars, that Anya knows about Lord of the Rings. That level of detail, well, that's not quite correct because that level of, sorry about the silly voice there, doesn't bless you, does it? But that level of kind of, no, I know this intimately, well, that's where Ezra is. He's like, no, well, because, and because, and I understand these things because. He's at that level. He's God, word of God, warp speed, that's Star Trek, isn't it? Warp speed nerd. And what he knows is of far greater significance than Marvel, Disney, anything else you want to name. He knows the word of God. And he knows how the application works to the point where it's going to affect an entire nation. But take note this little line here, I, I, I highlight as well, I think. Um, up to the bottom, again, it says it again. Um, it said it before. Um, and it will say it again. The hand of the Lord, his God, was, was on him. That's right at the end. And I'm going to circle back to that. Um, there you go. Sorry. So let's, let's read Ezra 7, 7 to 10 now. And they went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and the Levites and the singers and the gatekeepers and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month he began to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem. For, God's ha God's, for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and teach its statutes and rules in Israel. So, a couple of things. Multi-month journey, four, probably four based on that. Depends how they were measuring the months. Do you want to know how far they had to walk? Easy to remember, proclaimers. How far? 500 miles. Okay, that's how far they had to walk. Is it 500 miles? Have I got that right? Yeah, a thousand more, whatever it is. But 500 miles, okay, so it's a, it's a journey. And they probably went further because they probably avoided the desert, so more than even 500 miles. Dangerous journey, threat, peril. There is chaos going on in the region. There's a lot of fighting going on. But the Persian king Artaxerxes starts to see things. God seems to protect these people. God, when people are on mission for him, God seems to look after them and bring them through peril unscathed. So the shortness of that little section hides a really rough 
journey. But this determination that says, if God's called us, God is with us, we will go, and God protects them, starts to talk to this king, Artaxerxes. When God calls us to something, when God calls you to something, one of the things I'm, I get most concerned about is someone says, God's called me to this, and then three weeks later, it's not really working. Or not really getting going. God, when God calls you to something, and I say this about the work with the Afghans, if you don't mind me, I don't mean to boast in any way, but the reason we are where we are, seven months later, the reason we're being recognized as a group of people that really genuinely care, not by the council, but by the Afghans themselves, is because they say, you're still here. Everyone else is gone. They said to me last week, all everyone talks about now is Ukraine, and we're still here. And it's worse for us than it was three months ago because we're now stuck and we're going to go into Ramadan and we're going to fast and we're going to try and do it in a hotel that don't have our food. But you're still here. Not me, us, the people that they see. That's a standout difference. It's a standout witness. When God sees, when people see God in people or they testify to God and they're the only ones left standing while everything else just disappears. Gets bored, moves on to the next thing. If God gives you a ministry, stick with it through trial, through challenge. It will speak volumes. Sticking with something that's hard speaks infinitely more than sticking with something that's easy. Again, you'll see it there. See that line I did highlight it again, sir, on this one. For the good hand of his God was on him. And several scholars say you want to link that in. Because, and here's what I want to come back to in a little bit. For he had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to study the Bible, to do it and teach it, the statutes and the rules in Israel. And I come back to that as the big challenge. But for me, the big challenge in Ezra 7 is this, to know, to do, and to teach. What comes next is a long letter. The king of Persia writes, and I'm not going to go through the details, both because I want to save a little time for the end, um, but also it's really an echo of exactly what we see in the first part of Ezra, and you're going to see it again. It's a do-it-again God moment. He says, this Persian king, who doesn't believe in God, by the way, pagan, believes in many gods, doesn't believe in their God, recognizes something about their God, says, you can come back and I will facilitate it all. I will give you all the resources and everything you need to do it. So this is like I said with the list the other day. This is just the detailed evidence. This is why it goes into, if you look at it in front of you, it's got lots and lots of details in it. We're not going to read every part of it, but at least a bit of it. Look at 16 to 17. This just, just so easy to read scripture and think, me, listen to this. This is the king of Persia. Remember how big I just told you Persia was? It stretches across many nations now. And he says this, with all the silver and gold that you shall find in the province of Babylon and the, with the free will offerings of the people and the priests, vowed willingly for their house, for the house of their God that is in Jerusalem. With this money, then you shall, with all diligence, buy bulls, rams, and lambs, with the grain offerings and the drink offerings, and you shall offer them to the altar of the house of your God it, that is in Jerusalem. Then it goes on, and I'll, I'll probably come back to it. Did I, did I put it there? Yeah, the bottom there. And whatever else is required from the house of God, the, which it fails to provide, you may take it out of the king's treasury. The king of Persia. The king of Persia says, well, if, if there's not enough there in Babylon, you can get in my bank account. Here's the details. I'll take what you want from the king of Persia. That's like God saying, listen, when I call your mission, I will open up the storehouses of heaven and the reality of the storehouses on earth. It's the king of Persia's bank account. They've got his sort code, they've got his number, and they've got his pin, and they've got the number of three digit, digits on the back. They have access to the king of Persia's bank account. And he's pagan. He doesn't believe in their God. He believes in many gods. But he sees something in them, and God says God stirred him like he stirred Cyrus to do something for these people. And he doesn't know why, really. He is trying to avoid a rebellion, no doubt. But to open up his entire storehouse, his bank account, that's what happened when God's had the plan. Even those who oppose him, who are not for him, 
we're working with a council that isn't, that actually would rather we didn't. In fact, in the early days, said, you're not going to mention any of the Christian faith stuff, are you? We're like, we'll see. <laughs> and then Marion just told you, of course we did. <laughs> we even had a session with them one night. You tell us about Ramadan, we'll tell you about Easter. And they went, okay then. They told us all about Ramadan, and we told them all about Easter. So they're creating opportunity, not even knowing it, for us to share the gospel. And that's not our primary focus. Our focus is to love them first. Friendship first, as Brian's always told me. All I want to say to you is if God calls you to a work, and he will, he will provide for it. Now, it may turn out to be really quite tough at times. But I think God rewards you in your diligence. He won't reward you if you say, well, it, it, it just I thought it was a good idea, but it was just tough after a few weeks, and clearly God's not in it. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That's not how it would work, in my view. God will be in it when he sees your heart to persist in difficulties. He'll bring resource your way if you are faithful. He will make a way, and often from the most unlikely sources. Yeah, I'll say this. We're doing some work with Afghan refugees. Did you know that? <laughs> I may not have mentioned it. Uh, last week, we've been given, we were given a grant by the um, Hertfordshire um, Communities Foundation for 5,000 about, about two months ago. And they said to us, listen, if you, if you spend it well and you manage it well, we, we might give you some more. They gave us another four and a half grand last week. We're at 31,000 pounds now of people giving us stuff to do this work. And I believe it's because we have been faithful and we've not given up. We're diligent and God will provide. And when you read that there, that uh, 17 to 23 that I've got. Look at verse 20. As I said, that's an example of that in our real life. We're just opening up the foundation saying, here's what you need to do what you need to do. And it wasn't even that hard to do at the end of the day. He carries on then through verse 22. And then we see Artaxerxes start to reveal something. So you see this thing here, the thing at the top there says, whatever else is required for the house of your God, etc. And then it says this, whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done in full for the house of the God of heaven, lest his wrath be against the realm of of the king and his sons. It starts to re reveal that he's actually afraid of the God that they love, the God that these people serve. He's a pagan, but he's just like today's people. They be we believe in many things, but God's a bit of a mystery. We believe in all these things in life, but God's a bit of a mystery. God stands above them all. He sees it moving in their lives. He sees a people, Artaxerxes sees a people of real faith and he starts to worry about there's something about you and fear may be a word of, uh, mixed up with curiosity and he wants to start, maybe he wants to start to get to know the God they're worshipping. We sing our God is greater, our God is stronger, our God is higher than any other, meaning there are many gods. There is gods that people believe in, the God of money, the God of sex, the God of drugs, the God of parting the God of all these things. We say, look, we know those gods, small g. Our God is greater. Our God is higher. Our God is stronger than any other. People need to see that in us and go, well, look, I know I want to do those things, but it doesn't seem to give the fulfillment that those people have. We've talked about it today, being pearls, being light, shining out. Who wants to be like us if we're, if we're as flat and as down as everyone else? If there's no joy in us? Artaxerxes start to see something in these people that said they must worship a strong God. A God that I, 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 I revere and fear even though I don't know him. If we show a determination to worship God in a world where we are opposed, where we might even be mocked, people will be curious. People will be curious. They may not say that to you, but when they see something in you of God, they will be curious, if at best confused, often curious. Then you see it in verse 24, just to seal the favor of God in this entire story, it says, 
and it shall not be lawful to impose, impose tribute, custom, or toll on any of the priests, and so on. And, and, and Artaxerxes says, and we're not even going to tax you. It's just a confirmation of everything that's gone before, that he says, I'm going to give you every favor I can. The letter closes, I won't, I won't read this out in detail, with just um, the charge on Ezra to set up the judicial system, to set up the law, to set up the courts, to set up everything. He's given authority even to set up the courts. This is what I think happens when you're faithful to the word of God, the calling. He provides resources. He provides a way for us to, sac to see a sacrifice for sins. He provides a way for us to worship. He frees us from burdens. He enables us as a people to be taught in his word. And he allows the discipline that accompanies it. And finally, finally, we get to hear from Ezra himself. And at this point, the, the, the book of Ezra shifts into the first person. So at this point, it moves away from a story being told to actually you hear from Ezra. And for the rest of it, you're going to hear in the first person things from Ezra and Nehemiah. And he summarizes what God's done. And I wonder if these words could come out of our mouths. I would be so pleased if they could start to come out of our mouths. I want to read them out like I'm going to read them out from my position in this church to testify. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such things into the heart of the king to beautify, to restore, that is, the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, to, to restore and beautify the church, and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counsellors, and before the king's mighty officers, I took courage, for the hand of the Lord my God was on me, and I gathered men, I gathered leading men from Israel to go out with me. I, what, do I, what do I think Ezra is trying what do I think Ezra is trying to show us here not Ezra the person, Ezra the story I think it's this if we did this slide like this morning most people in the UK no longer read the Bible they read you Artaxerxes is not reading the Bible he's reading Ezra He's looking at him and saying, that is a man of God, and therefore, I'm going to equip him with everything I have to serve his God. Most people in this country don't read the Bible anymore. They're reading you and me. We might need to edit this out. We'll have to decide later. Chloe's there. Chloe does not read the Quran. Chloe reads the Afghans. She evaluates Islam on what she sees. If they behave well, she considers what they believe to be of value. If they behave badly, which has been a bit of recently, she says, well, that's a load of rubbish then, isn't it? Chloe doesn't read the Bible either. She reads us. She reads us and she decides on our faith based on what she sees. And she sees a diligent, faithful, self-sacrificing people from a church that she believes must be good. Now she's not met you all, she just knows that we're coming from somewhere that does what it says that seems to not only know the word, but do the word. And in that witnessing, teaches the word. Do you understand what I'm saying here? We know what God tells us to do, to love the stranger, to lay our lives down like Jesus did for the other. Jesus lays his life down for us. He lays his life down to pay for our sin that we might be reunited with God. That laying down of life is what we understand, so we then do it, and therefore we teach the Bible by our actions. She sees, you know the fruits of the Spirit? 
Love, patience, self-control, all these things. You could read that scripture, and she go, and go, but if she sees it, if she sees it, then she starts to ask questions. And we have had some good conversations. We live in a world full of Chloe's, full of Artaxerxes, full of people who will decide on what we have to say by what they see us do. Every day, every day, you and me have a chance to be in Ezra. Every day. We don't have the knowledge he may have, but we have knowledge of Scripture. And if we don't, we should try and get some more. But we have every day a chance to be Ezra's out in the world. We may not be in the line of Aaron, the great high priest, but we are sons and daughters of the Most High King. Our line is to Jesus Christ, as was reminded today. We do things in the name of Jesus Christ. Our line is Jesus. Our line is the Son of God himself. Our line is to the Father. Aaron doesn't compare. Not that Aaron. That Aaron doesn't compare. He doesn't either. But Aaron in Scripture, amazing, of course. He's the original great high priest. He's someone that was revered. He was the one that went into the holies of holies in the tabernacle. If you know that. That line's amazing. Our line's even better. Our line is to God himself and Jesus Christ, his son. We are sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, co-heirs. So you want to have a good line? You want your genealogy to be good? It's the best. It's the best because you're a son and daughter of the most high king. I think I put it at the bottom there. Yeah, look. For we are a temple of the living God. God says, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. What gave Ezra credibility in the eyes of the king of Persia and impressed him was that he lived a life right before his very eyes. He lived it out. He was a man with a heart to study the word of God, a man then who lived it out. His conduct clearly set that he was sitting under the authority of that word because of the way he would have behaved. He would have behaved impeccably. So the guy said, right, you say it and you do it. And that gave him the right to teach. That sequel is not, not, is not an accident. Derek Kidner in his book says this. With study, conduct and teaching put deliberately in the right order, each was able to function properly as, at its best. Study was saved from unreality. So you can, LST people hear me here, you can study the Bible as much as you like. Anyone who loves to study the Bible. But when you act it out, you save it from unreality. Conduct from uncertainty and teaching from insincerity and shallowness. So the central challenge for me of Ezra 7 is asking us three tough questions. And I'm going to end on this. Wasn't too bad. How is your time in the Word of God? Do you want better time in the Word of God? Just to save any difficulties? I do. Okay? I do. I don't spend enough time in the Word of God. I do daily Bible studies with my wife in the morning. Three minutes. She reads beautifully. So to do that, I listen to our morning routine at the moment is listen to worship song. Jane reads out word for the day. That's not enough. It's not enough. Because if I want to know how to live it out, I need to know what I'm supposed to live out. So, do we give enough time to the Word of God? And if we do, do we allow it to minister to us, giving it enough time to speak and have the authority it has when it comes to us through the Spirit? So first of all, we need to spend time in study. And you'll be struggling, won't you? Let's just not pretend we struggle to find the time to study the Word of God. So we read it in bits, and that's not enough, so it doesn't feel like it's doing anything because it's just pop culture type, what do you call it? Sound bites. Thank you. If you struggle, get some prayer today. We've got an amazing prayer team. They want to pray with you to say, can you help me just figure out how I'm going to do this? Because God will provide the time. He will do a miracle in your life, I believe. You'll think, 
just to be clar clarify another, so many tangents to that, it's amazing, isn't it? When we had children, we went like, what on earth did we do with that time? Because now we seem to be busy, but back then we thought we were busy, and now we've got that. So what on earth was that? How do we fit this in with the life we thought was busy before? Because God made a way. Because God made a way. And he'll make a way to enable you to spend more time with the word. So get some prayer to shake off what hinders you from that and that the word will work in you and transform you. Get prayer for the spirit to help so the word comes alive in you and you're not just reading it like any old book. Do you struggle to do what the word says, to live it out? Because that's what made all the difference to Artaxerxes, that he saw Ezra living it out, that he knew the word and he lived it. So is there an aspect of your life that you know is contrary to scripture? And you try to justify it, convincing yourself that despite what the word says, God won't mind if I bend it. Ezra studies it, and it says the Persian king was impressed with his life. So do you need prayer to bring some aspect of your life back in line with Scripture? That you know, I need prayer for this because I'm struggling to line it up with Scripture. And finally, do you want to teach or tell others? And that's tricky because I don't mean teaching like I'm doing right now. I mean, do you want to be able to witness to others? Ezra's a scribe. Uh, later on, that term will turn into teacher. By the way, scribes don't end up doing very well. By the time we hit the New Testament, they've got the law thing's gone to their heads. And they even they lose direction. They were set up so well. But because of the authority that's given to them, by the time we get later, it's like the Pharisees and the scribes are generally the ones that are opposing Jesus. They lose the grace somewhere along the way. But you and I don't teach that way. You and I teach by the way we live our lives and sharing our story. Because only, only we can tell our own stories of what God has done in our life. But have you become afraid to share what God has done? Are you fearful? Does it become an issue for you? Then I say get some prayer today for the courage you need through the Holy Spirit to be able to share why you are the way you are, to share your stories of God. Can I pray for us? Is that all right? And then there will be this incredible prayer team. Really excited to pray for you in the corner about any of those things. Do you want more time in the Word of God? Do you know there's an aspect of your life you need to help live it out as the Word says? And do you want help sharing and teaching and telling others about Jesus? Yeah, Heavenly Father, nothing's really gone to plan today. And we trust that's because you had a plan from the moment we gathered this morning, 10 o'clock to pray, it's been a morning of you shifting and moving things around, Father. And we thank you, Lord. If that was your purpose, then we say thank you, Father, for all you've done. I pray that in the kind of depth of what we've tried to cover quickly in Ezra 7, Father, God, your message has come through clearly. That we need to know the word, do the word. And when we do the word, we teach the word. Help us to be your light. Help us to be those pearls. Help us to be that that shines out in all the places you place us, Father God. And I pray, Father, for opportunity to share why we are the way we are. More opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. More opportunity to say this is because we follow a servant king who laid his life down for everyone who will believe in him. So we lay our lives down, Father. Teach us how to, to do that to share who you are with our families that we've stopped sharing with, with our work colleagues that we're embarrassed about talking to, with the people we bump into, we think this will just make the conversation awkward. Give us the courage, Father God, to speak of you. Let us all be Ezra's. In Jesus' name, amen.